I suppose demonstrate that orthodoxy is not entirely rigid and that we can be flexible. As much as I have relished the opportunity to introduce all of our speakers here today, I've been asked by a good friend of ours uh, if he could introduce our next speaker. And I will only say by way of introducing our next speaker that Jeffrey St. John is a nationally and internationally recognized columnist and newscaster and writer and has the rare distinction of having been fired from all four of the major networks. Uh, Jeffrey St. John. <laughs> I don't want you all to think that I'm giving in to my natural and sometimes overwhelming ego egoism or egotism in wanting to introduce our next speaker, but I think you should know something about him. I've known him for 15 years. I'm justly proud of the fact that for about uh, seven of that 15, I have been browbeating him uh, at least once, sometimes twice a month for him to get off his duff and out of his book line bunker and into the trenches. And uh, I can say uh, with justifiable pride that, uh, that he's done that. I first met Otto Scott in 1966 when someone gave me the text of a speech called The Silent Majority. It was a speech given by the head of the Ashland Oil and Refining Company. And uh, I said, a businessman could not have written this. This had to be written by someone, and I want to find out who that someone is. So I called the Ashland Oil and Refining Company, and I said, I wish to speak to the man in the PR department. And Otto Scott answered the phone, and that's how our uh, deep and abiding friendship began. I think I can point out to you with some pride that the silent majority ultimately became the major theme of the Nixon campaign. And I can say that I think that Otto probably had a great deal to do with the um, plagiarism of that particular uh, uh, memorable phrase. Otto Scott is a former merchant seaman, is in his own right has done a diverse series of tasks in the fields of communication. He has been a feature writer for the uh, United uh, Feature Syndicate. He has been in advertising. He has been in... Um, the communications director for one of the major, or we should say one of the large independent oil companies in the world. And for the last 10 or 12 years, he has been what I have called a first-rate Christian historian. His books include James I, Robespierre, The Voice of Virtue, uh, The Secret Six, John Brown and the Abolitionist Movement, and he will soon complete the fourth of a quartet on Woodrow Wilson. He calls them the four sacred fools of history. <laughs> that was the original theme for the James book, the Robespierre book, the Brown book, and the Wilson book. And Otto, in his genius and brilliance, managed to perceive by his reading and his writing that these four figures, these four fools of history, epitomized the 17th, 18th, 19th, and the 20th century. These were the destructive elements which basically rendered and injured the culture and the society as a whole. Otto Scott is now in the process of completing what I, I've lost count, I think it's his eighth book. You are, I believe, and take it from a person who is a professional and who's had long 25 years this year of experience in many phases of the media, that there is no one in the Christian movement in America or the world who can speak more authoritatively and with eloquence and candor than our friend and uh, fellow uh, co-worker and warrior, Otto J. Scott. Otto? If I had any sense now, I'd sit down. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, Rush, and Frankie Schaefer. Brilliant talk. Very, very difficult 
to be brilliant. Some years ago, when I was a young man, a great many years ago, trying to be a writer, I submitted a short story to a very eminent professor of English at Berkeley, who was also, in his own right, a very good writer in his day, named Anthony Boucher. Mr. Boucher read the manuscript, and he said it's as good as anything in print, which made me feel very big. Then he said very seriously, I'm terribly sorry to say also that it resembles everything in print. <laughs> and he said the world expects more than that from a new writer. The world expects a viewpoint from a new artist, he expects an angle of vision of which we were never before aware. And we expect that he will make that perception clear to the rest of us so that we never again see things the same way. I've never forgotten that description of an artist because I think it is the most precise that I've ever run across. And it took me a considerable number of years before I began to feel that I saw the world differently than those who came before me. However, we do have to remember that an artist is a product of his time. We are still subject to the rules of fashion and to the pressures of the world. Without an audience, or without somebody to judge our work, without clients, without publishers, we're simply people on their own. We are so much people, creatures of our time, that even our divergences and our independent attitudes reflect the period. We look at photographs, for instance, of people taken in the 19th century, let's say the 1880s, 1890s, and they all seem to look alike. It's not just the clothes, it's also the posture, it's not only the beard, it's an expression in the eyes, in the face. They're all products of a special era. We look even at the rebels of the 19th century. We look at Karl Marx. We look at Nietzsche. We look at Wagner. They all look alike. They have frock coats. They have wing collars. They have great beards. They have flowing ties. Therefore, if we want to evaluate an artist, we have to know something about the period in which he lived and acted. We have to know something about the pressures of his time before we can properly judge his reactions to those pressures. In the ancient Greek world, for instance, which is constantly elevated to our attention by art historians, there were no morals as we understand them today. There was only honor and power. The statues were painted with lifelike colors. The hair, the eyes, the fingernails, the tubes. So that they looked like naked men and women enlarged many times. There were no inhibitions, no restraints of a Victorian nature in the pagan world. The same lack of inhibition was true when they wrote plays, when they depicted them on the stage, and in all their essays, poetry, and so forth. Now, the Greeks had a very dark view of the world. Their religion was based upon the idea that gods behaved the way Greeks behaved. 
Their gods were capable of envy. They could envy human beings because the Greeks were an envious people. And they believed that the gods treated human beings as puppets. They tricked them. They led them deliberately into frustrating experiences. They broke them if they were too proud, if they tried to stand up too tall. In this sort of religion, in which everything recurred, the seasons recurred, people recurred, the heavens revolved, and everything that you ever had happen to you would eventually return and you would live through all these agonies again. In this culture, in Athens, criminals were punished, as of course they're punished in all civilization. But they had the principle of exile. And who did they exile? They exiled those who made them feel envious. They exiled the honorable. They exiled the talented. They exiled the most successful. Aristides was exiled because they got sick and tired of the fact that he was known to be honest. He bored them. When paganism reappears, we see envy returning. Today, in the modern pagan period, we hardly know of anyone who is prominent in the theater or in the arts or in politics who is not pursued by a long string of dirty and scandalous stories. Success. Success brings enemies. It brings, it evokes envy. And in a world where the seven deadly sins can no longer be named, are considered not to exist, envy can emerge quite freely. It would be very foolish, I think, to underestimate the downward pull that paganism has exerted in history. The Romans fell to that heritage from the Greeks, and Terence, very famous Roman poet, said, nothing that is human is alien to me. Well, that covered a lot. It covered murder, it covered incest, it covered all the sins to which we are heir. Christianity, as Dr. Rush Jr. reminded us, altered that and introduced an art that transcends the everyday and elevates the spirit. But paganism represents the dark side of the human race and the dark, rebellious nature of man with which we were all born. And it never entirely disappeared, even during the ages of faith. It was during the Renaissance, which represented, according to Burkhart, the decline of the faith in Europe, that Italy rediscovered the pagan culture of the ancient Greeks and Romans, and began to bring them back to everyday life. They lost the idea of immortality in heaven and decided that the only true immortality was in becoming famous and celebrated. You would have an immortality by being remembered. This was a Grecian idea. It was a Roman idea. If you became famous in the Greek world, you became a god. If you became famous in the Renaissance, you became godlike. We still have that idea. There are people today who feel that they don't exist because they're not well known in the world of propaganda, in the uh, great enlarged echoes of television or whatever. What the art historians who extol the Renaissance 
rarely manage to tell us, however, is that these great artists flowered on a heap of dung. A period of Christian decline accompanied by some of the greatest Christian art ever produced, which is quite an interesting paradox. The reasons are complex, and I'm not going to take the time to go into them in detail. Let us say that there arose within the country of Italy and the city-states that composed it at that time the pagan idea that all is permitted in the pursuit of power. So you had a series of coups in the various cities, in Milan, in Florence, in Rome, in Geneva, and so forth. But the new rulers associated themselves and patronized and subsidized artists of all degrees, writers, musicians, painters, sculptors. And by surrounding themselves with beauty, they were able to say that they had created a work of art out of government. And each of them became responsible for everything. He became responsible for charity, charitable works. He became responsible for the arts and humanities. He became responsible for the safety of the people. He became responsible for the style of architecture. Everything you can think of. Now, the artists that they employed were, of course, very great. We have da Vinci, whose first assignment was to design dresses for the women of the court. We have Raphael, who watched massacres in the village square of Perugia. Some historians feel that's the reason he kept painting pictures of St. George and the dragon. Only in his day there wasn't anybody killing the dragon. And probably the most familiar to us are the writers. Officially, they produced elegant pieces. Unofficially, they produced pornography, obscene poetry, satires, libels against each other. They had desperate lives. They were received in the palace, and they had to worry about how they were going to feed their families at the same time. They had to compete with another, one another for jobs as secretaries or private historians. And they remind me very much of the professors of today or the writers of Hollywood. Burkhardt said, such men can hardly be conceived to exist without inordinate pride. They needed it, if only to hold their heads above water. They were treated with alternate admiration and contempt, much as a writer is treated today by business. Does this sound familiar? It should be. We have national magazines in which the work of the writers is ostracized and there is no byline. Or if there is a byline, it comes at the tag end of the essay in Time magazine and it's got 18 names on it and not the editors. We think of the journalists who walks into the city room and trembles when he is called before the city desk. He can beard the President of the United States, but he never gets funny with the city desk. We would find the Renaissance extremely familiar. We would be able to walk into it and feel at home as soon as we got used to the clothes. I bring that period back very briefly for a reason. The reaction against the excesses of the Renaissance is called the Reformation. And during that re reaction, when statues were pulled out of the churches, when paintings were burned, 
when the churches were whitewashed inside and out. In reaction to the Renaissance, in reaction to the Baroque beauties that the papacy erected, the reformers tended to consider beauty and art part of the snares of the world, part of the devices of the devil. Of course, I'm making a very selective generality. There was great art in Germany and in the North, as Rush mentioned. The Protestant world had its artists and its geniuses, but they flourished to some extent during the dying days of the High Renaissance in the North. Shakespeare was more of a Renaissance figure, and his people were Renaissance figures with their great intellect and their eloquence and lack of morality than they were Protestants. They certainly were not Protestants. Elizabeth I and James I lived in a Renaissance period in Britain, although they were followed by the Reformation. And of course, James was one of those figures who unwittingly evoked the Reformation in Britain. He had every vice. They called him Shamey Jamie in Scotland. He was a homosexual, he was a false scholar, he was intolerant, always in the name of tolerance. By the time he got through shaming the people of Great Britain, they had to have a reformation just to get the smell out of their minds. After the reformation, or once it got started, we had the whole idea of art as a form of worship. And the role of the artist altered. Where before his patron consisted of the tyrant or the government or only the wealthy and the powerful, he became, as Rush indicated, a businessman. He could sell his work to anybody. He could paint about anybody. He didn't have to pick somebody from the top to draw a portrait. And he mentioned Rubens, I happen to think of Rembrandt, who had a workshop, who had apprentices, who became for a while very well off. And uh, as so often happens to those of us in the arts, was carried away and got extravagant and lost his home in an auction and so forth. But he remained. He remains. Great work. In all of this, however, was a relatively short period. The Reformation introduced so much liberty, so much innovation, so much creativity, that whole nations became wealthy. And once wealthy, began to decline. We think of France, we think of Britain. It was in Britain in the early 1700s that religion was first inundated with a wave of ridicule. And it was there in London that Voltaire learned how to make fun of the church. He went back to Paris to carry the message and as we know, he infected a great many. And during the Enlightenment, we had again the paradox of a great artistic flowering. The theater flourished, painting flourished, music flourished, furniture was beautiful. To this day, when the French want to show you high culture, they take you back to the products of the Ancien Regime. And once again, as in the Renaissance, morals went to the bottom. And as in the Renaissance, which was ended in Italy by the sack of Rome, which broke the Italian spirit to this time, the great enlightenment of France ended in the terror and the guillotine. <laughs>
and the dictatorship of Napoleon. That lesson lasted roughly one generation, which is 30 years. And pretty soon the old ideas began to bubble up again in the Victorian period. The Victorian period was only uniquely different from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment because they had certain inhibitions against public expression of sexuality. Therefore, the literature of the Victorian period lacks certain reality. Dickens was great in everything except women. Tolstoy carried us into a never-never land. Dostoevsky was the rare exception. He wrote about the problems that plague us to this day. And, of course, we know the end of the great Victorian Enlightenment. We know the end of Mr. Darwin, the end of Mr. Marx, the end of Mr. Freud, World War I, in which everything collapsed. Tolstoy's uncle, watching it, thought of the Peloponnesian War, in which the Greeks destroyed one another. Because like the Greek city-states who spoke a different dialect and considered one another foreigners, the Europeans, speaking different languages, thought of themselves as separate enclaves, separate nations, instead of what they were, one common body of Christendom. Now, the Victorian rise was not especially unique. It had restored neo-paganism. I have several books at home regarding the impact of the ancient Greek ideas upon the British and upon the Germans. The English boarding school was set up on the Greek and uh, Platonic pattern and led to accusations by other nations of the Greek problems. Artistically speaking, we came out of World War I with a shattered civilization, with artists who decided that nothing made any sense, with writers like Hemingway who said we don't want to hear any more of the noble words. All those words, honor, truth, justice, pushed to one side. If we look back, however, at how the Reformation started, I think we'll find something here that might alter this particularly dark view that I've been giving you. When Luther nailed his challenge on the door of the church, he was not making an act of great defiance. He was calling for a debate upon certain points. And in those days, the scholar who wanted to uh, indulge in a debate would put up his theses that he wanted to argue in that manner. What happened when Luther did that was that printing had just emerged. There were a bunch of new printers in Germany and somebody took Luther's theses to one of the printers and the printer printed up a number of thousand copies and they began to be distributed and other printers picked up copies and reprinted them. So that within a matter of a few weeks, Luther's challenge was all over Europe. At any other time, it would have been simply a conversation between scholars. But with that new instrument which had appeared, a message against the religious monopoly was suddenly broadcast throughout the West. Today, we go back to the Renaissance. The role of the artist is back where it was then, back where it was under the Greeks and the Romans, back where it was under the Medicis, under Ivan the Terrible, under Elizabeth, under James, 
enslaved by the government and the powerful in China, in the Soviet Union, and other totalitarian lands, those who have the ability to express ideas in one media or another are enlisted in the army of the pseudo-proletariat. And here, here, as Frankie Schaefer indicated, we are pressed out of the mansion. When my book on the Secret Six was published by the New York Times Book Company, the president of the book company was called in by the hierarchy of the New York Times Corporation and given a good flogging. They said, you have made a dreadful mistake in selecting that book for publication. So not one ad was ever made on that particular work. I had to buy the rights back, and he was surprised that I wrote, that I bought the rights back. Nobody divorces the New York Times. <laughs> How does this come about? Well, artists have to eat. Musicians have families. If all the rewards are offered by our enemies, then it's no wonder that the enemies control the artistic sector. Everyone has to live. And the left has a variety of costumes and faces. It appears in one place as a foundation and in another as a production company and a third place as a publisher with a big book club attached. Films, critics, commentators, distributors, the fashionable world, the establishment. Fortunately for us today, the establishment is crumbling. The movie audiences are reduced to children and adolescents and the retarded. <laughs> Television channels are openly derided. Radio has the attention span of an idiot. Books are cheats more often than not. Bestsellers appear, appear on remainder tables within weeks after they fall off the bestseller list, which, as we know, are fraudulent. I recall that the occupants of a fashionable apartment in Central Park West in New York lost in a burglary a very expensive abstract expressionist painting. Their problem was they couldn't describe it to the police. <laughs> Tom Wolfe began to laugh at the modern expressionist and abstract expressionist painters. He called it the painted word. And that laughter set off the whole country. And they're still trying to turn it off in New York, and they haven't succeeded. At this moment, therefore, we are in a very unusual position. One that has not been duplicated since Martin Luther printer discovered the theses. We are now witnessing all across the board the beginning of the end of the attempt to deceive the entire West at the same time. There is an, a, a Christian revival underway which is taking too many forms for even Norman Lear to monitor. <laughs> When John Gardner writes about moral fiction and Tom Wolfe mocks the Bauhaus, when Solzhenitsyn makes other writers appear childish, when glorious operas long unheard are being unearthed and restaged, when ballet becomes a mass passion, something unusual is underway. Why are we here now? 
to move our individual reactions into a movement. I see that movement as a coalition of Christian artists who will, from becoming acquainted with one another here, begin to critique and evaluate and spread the word about one another's work and will move toward replacing what now appears in the art with productions that reflect and expand our faith. I do not mean by that that we should have any unanimity of approach. I do not recommend a return to the past. Every period has its style, its expression, its special vision. In my view, a Christian cannot produce anything except Christian art. And what a Christian produces is Christian art. That doesn't mean, for instance, that the cross is on the cover of any of my books. The viewpoint is Christian. The standard of values is Christian. And those readers who are moved by what I write are moved in a Christian direction. The same is true of whatever other artists produce. And since I believe that our work in art is a form of worship, what we produce is for the greater glory of God. It inspires us and maintains us in our vocation. It is essential, therefore, that we know who we are and where we are going, and that we know each other and help each other so that we can travel there together. In this occurrence, it takes no great ability to see the hand of God. We look back across four centuries and we can see the hand of God in producing the instruments that conveyed Luther's message. Now, only a few years ago, we were restricted to the media, the press, the radio, television, films, art, dealerships, and so forth. Without a microphone, nobody could be heard. Without a press, nobody could be published. Without expensive cameras and films, no movies could be made. But today, word processors and computers are making typewriters obsolete. Printers attached to those computers can eliminate galley proofs and page proofs and go straight into type. We have these instruments in our home. What does this do to the printers? I remember a few years ago, if a printer had 50 different typefaces, that he was in business. Of course, he had to spend a half a million dollars to get it. Now I can buy a new typeface for nine dollars and I have my choice among fifty. We have, in effect, printing presses in our offices. We have videotape, cheaper than film. We have cameras. We can hire our own hall. We can publish our own books. We can set up our own art dealerships. For the first time in 400 years, we have seen the emergence of the tools we need to reconstruct the world view and to overcome Dostoevsky's devils crawling across the landscape. We have the tools, we have the people, and we have God behind us, and we know that because if he were not, the tools would not be available. The Bible says there's a time for all things, time to live, time to die. We might add there's a time to wait and a time to fight. I think this is our time now, and I think we should do it together. Thank you very much.